This is Alabama Politics with Steve Flowers, an in-depth interview with Alabama's top political newsmakers. Now, from the studios of Troy University, here is Steve Flowers. I'm Steve Flowers, and welcome to Alabama Politics. Folks, we're fortunate tonight to have as our guest one of my good friends in politics. We've got to be best buddies. Uh, probate Judge J.C. Love. J.C. is Montgomery's probate judge and uh, has just been reelected. We've not fully reelected yet to his second six-year term. He's running for his second six-year term, and he ran the Democratic primary in March, y'all. And y'all guess what percent of the vote he got? Ninety-one percent. I hadn't seen anybody get 90% for 91% uh, in, in his race for re-election Democratic primary. Now, he's going to be on the ballot this November, too. Have you, you got a Republican, have you? No, no Republican opposition. And so, uh, subject to any write-ins, then I have the opportunity to continue to serve as probate judge here in Montgomery County. It's been six years ago you first ran. Well, you know, I, I, got, that, I got appointed by Governor Ivy back in uh, November of 2019, so about five years. Okay, so you didn't run in, in the 2018. Uh, no, th uh -huh. that uh, Mayor Reed, when he was still probate that's judge, he had right, run, and so I finished right. the balance of his I'd unexpired term. I forgot about that. So this is really your first term? This election? is my first term, yes. Uh -huh. So you didn't have to run at all. You served five years without yeah. uh, being appointed. Yeah, we're probate judges got the exemption from the law that you don't have to run in the next uh, nearest uh -huh. election as the district. and. Uh, the circuit court judges, so you just finish out the balance of the unexpired probate judge's term. So. District and circuit judges, don't have, they got to run the next time. You got to run the, the next closest election, so yes. Yeah. J.C. Love was born and raised right here in Montgomery County. Right oh, here yeah. in Montgomery, right in the city of Montgomery. Where'd you, where, now, where, where, what hospital were you born in? I was born in, in Baptist Hospital before there was a Baptist South or Baptist East. So what is Baptist uh, south now on the Eastern Boulevard. That's where I was born. What year were you born? Uh, 1978. So you're not even 40. You, you, that means you're 40. I'm 45. 45. <laughs> yes, I'm gonna turn 46 <laughs> this year. Uh, but yeah, December towards the end of 78, December of uh, 1978. Now is your wife about the same age? Well, yes, yeah, she was born in J January of 79. So we're about now, how many children do y'all have? We've got three three young kids, uh, two girls, eight and seven, and a son who's who just turned six, so eight, seven, and six. Well, y'all had stair steps, eight, yes. seven, and six. <laughs> and your wife's a very popular dermatologist here. Oh, yes, yeah, she is. She's also a Montgomery native, and so we met each other back in junior high over at Baldwin. Y'all um, met at junior high? Did y'all start dating? No, we didn't start dating until to much, much later. We were always friends, and I always had a crush on her. I could never convince her to go ahead and give me an opportunity until much later in life, and so. Her uh, dad is a state farm agent. Yes, he is. Yes, is he it is. Cedric? What's his Cedric last uh, name? Cedric Bradford. Yeah, is he still is he still doing the state? Or he retired? Oh no, he's not retiring. He's still going uh -huh. strong. And so her mother's a former educator and uh, had worked in MPS for about twenty five years, and then went on and worked for the State Department of Education and retired there. So she retired then. Oh uh, yes. Now your mom, your parents were they educators? Uh, no, but my mom, you know, she's been in education. She's been over the Outward Bound program over at Alabama State for uh -huh. about nearly 30 years. She's been over there since 96. My father, he passed in uh, 2021, but he was in retail over at Gapers and then Dillard's, um, you know, over in the housewares and then women's shoes and um, over in, in children's clothes. I think when he retired, I think in about 20, 2012, 2013, I think that's when he retired. JC, uh, after y'all went to Brubaker, did you, what, what, did y'all go to Jeff Davis? I went to Jeff Davis, so I went uh -huh. to, started at Brubaker Intermediate, then went to uh, Baldwin, and then finished up and graduated from Jeff Davis in 1997. What, what, did, where did you go to undergraduate school? I went to Morehouse College over in Atlanta. Yeah, all, everybody in Montgomery, all, <laughs> this, this is the Morehouse now. You and Stephen Reed. Yes, Kirk his Hatcher. His brother, Kirk Hatcher. Um, y'all all Judge Griffin, Judge Griffin. Griffin, yeah. So, it's, so uh -huh. you know, we've got a, a, a good size continued over here. But Morehouse you went to law here. school here in the state, didn't you? I went to Boston College. Boston I went up College. north and froze for a few years and then came back uh, down south and came back home in uh, 2013. Now, your first firm was with... Uh, I was with Preston and Stakely. That's right, yeah. You didn't do malpractice, though, did you? Yes, I did the defense, medical malpractice defense. defense so I spent a lot of time over at Jackson and I had uh -huh. hospitals uh, throughout the state. Trying to defend nurses, doctors, and hospitals uh -huh. against medical malpractice cases. 
J.C., so after that, then uh, you uh, took the appointment as probate judge. Yes. And what year was that? 2019. Uh, that was November 15th of 2019. Uh-huh. I think you came on the show right after that, didn't Yes, you? I did. You had me on, and we kind of talked about what kind of what my vision was for the office, and so uh -huh. it's definitely been a fast nearly five years. You know, let's go over some of that same stuff because the average person does not comprehend uh, you wear about four or five different hats. Oh, yes. As probate judge. People don't think of, they think, well, what does the probate judge do? I mean, let's start with marrying people for one thing. <laughs> Everybody wants to, they decide they want to get married, they come out of the probate office and get married. Yeah, they? they come down to our office and we do them every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 12 to 4. And um, I always tell people that uh, if you're here in Montgomery County and you're over the age of 18, then our office is going to touch you in some uh, way, shape, or, or fashion. So most people are familiar with us with the court system, dealing with the, the wills, the administration, the people who die without wills, the conservatorships and guardianships, the uh, adoptions. So all adoptions in the state start in the probate court, the eminent domains, the involuntary mental health commitments. But then we also, as you touched on, issue the marriage certificates. And we're one of the few probate courts in the state that still perform uh, weddings. And also the county business licenses renewing the tags and the driver's licenses, um, elections, records and recording, and overseeing the county archives. So it's definitely a, a big enterprise. Let's just give them, let's give them a numerals. Like number one would be you probate estates. Yes. That's the first, be the that, first that's, thing. That's the big thing that we do every day, starting off with the estates. Wheels estate. and estates, you get the probate of that. Yes. Uh -huh. And then the, the, the involuntary mental health commitments of those people that, who may that's be That's a different category, and that's two. Well, yeah, that's two. Health. That's number two. Yes. That's big. You know, I've had a lot of friends who've been probate judges over the years, and, and I, I used to go, sometimes they would ask me to speak to the Probate Judges Association, mm -hmm. and I'd have breakfast with some of my old friends there, and, and I'd ask each one of them, I'd say, What's the hardest job you got? One of them say would say uh, uh, commitments. Oh yeah. One would say uh, elections. One would say, uh, but I think that in recent times, the commitment thing was the hardest thing. Would you say that's your hardest? That is a commitment thing. Well, I can't you just turn it over to a professional and say, don't you just call in like a psychiatrist and say, is this person ready to be sent off or not? I well, mean, I, you know, you can't tell for sure. Well, most folks, you're going to have a clinical diagnosis from a physician saying about whether or not the person has a, a mental illness, and they believe that they meet the legal threshold, being a threat to themselves and others. We also have a guardian at light, an attorney who represents that individual, who also meets with them, and then uh, they'll come back with a recommendation about whether or not they are in the midst of a you know ongoing mental health crisis and need assistance. And uh, we have an attorney for the petitioner, and so. Uh, oftentimes we're able to, everyone kind of is in, in, in agreement of saying, well, this person is undergoing mental health crisis and they agree with the recommendation. Uh, but sometimes we have to have those hearings and make that determination. And, and the thing that we're finding now is, uh, is um, you know, particularly with, you know, post-COVID has been, we've had people coming before us for commitments who've never had any type of mental illness and younger people um, as who are coming in needing uh, commitments as well as those who are um, you know the dual diagnosis those individuals who may be on addicted to marijuana or alcohol or some other uh, substance that has to go ahead and get treated because you can't determine whether or not the you know the, the psychosis is, ca is caused by the the substance that they're, they're, they're taking so you got to try to kind of dual track and treat them both together. That was where I was going with it. So that would be the second thing, commitments would be the second. Oh, yes. And now that's where, that's where they would say, this so, drugs are so rampant now that yes. they mess people's minds up. Oh, it does. Uh, but where do they send them? You send them off to rehab? Or what do you, what do you, do you, are you the one that decides where they go? How, who makes that decision? Well, you know, generally, you know, that's kind of one of the uh, clinical kind of, kind of standpoint when they're going ahead and getting assessed. Um, because during when the petitions filed, they're picked up to being evaluated, and then within 72 hours, we have a hearing. And at that hearing, then we have a recommendation whether or not they should be committed on an inpatient basis or on an outpatient basis. And so uh, they've kind of got from different, uh, some of our mental health uh, facilities throughout the state where they'll go ahead and go. Sometimes they're not always here in Montgomery County. They may have to go to uh, Greer or someone in another part of the, uh, the state. Um, but 
that's that's something that the, the physician makes that determination. Oh, he makes that decision. Yeah. So you got you got uh, wills, probate and wills. Yes. You got estates. Uh, you know, I bet you have a lot of people come in. You have to make decisions on people's marital property. I mean, not marital, but family property. Oh, yeah. Somebody dies intestate. Well, Grandma really want me to have that piano. Oh, yeah. Or that old car or something. <laughs> well, those are some always the, the bitter disputes. And so, you know, as I tell folks why I enjoy the weddings and adoptions, I said, because no one's over here fighting. And so those are cases where you have the family members, the siblings sitting on the other sides of the courtroom. And I try to tell them, I said, oh, I don't think your, your mother, your father, or your brother and sister, depending on the situation, really expected you all to be sitting here fighting over the things they left behind. And so that's one of the things I really try to stress to people to have an estate plan because it doesn't matter if you've told me that when you pass on that I can get that, 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 uh, that piano. If it's not in writing, it's not in a will, that it's not gonna be binding. And so mm -hmm. um, that's something that really gets people because a lot of people believe that to have a will, you have to have a lot of assets. And it's like, well, in your life, you acquire a lot of things that don't have huge monetary value. You look at, you know, photographs. You look at, you know, the, the piano that's been passed down that was your grandmother's. Or you're looking at china. Or you're looking at jewelry. Those things may not have a huge monetary value, but they have a huge emotional value, mm -hmm. particularly when you're dealing with the loss of a parent or a grandparent um, and trying to have a piece of, of them to remember them by that it can definitely get very, very emotional. Well, then, then let's talk about elections. Oh, yes. Well, you, know, you, just got this, you just got through this election. <laughs> well, it was definitely a trial by fire coming because in 2020, shortly after I came, I think we had about uh, eight different special elections that year. So, you know, we, because... How long did you have at least in 2020? It was 2020 and 2021 going in there. We had um, um, the, uh, the presidential primary election. Uh -huh. um, and then we had, at that time, we had... Um, then state, uh, we had a state senate seat come open and at the end of 2020. Uh, and then we had, and that's when <laughs> Representative, then Representative Hatcher ran for the that senate. senate seat. And then when he won it, then we had to have a special election to fill, fill his senate seat. And then in 2021. Now somebody died or wasn't uh, uh, no. Yes, we had two seated councilmen. We had Councilman Tracy Larkin passed. And then we had Councilman uh, Bollinger. So we have two special elections for that. Um, and so, um, and then Representative uh, McClammy passed in September, but we didn't have to have a special election because the, um, only his uh, daughter, uh, Penny, uh, qualified to run and there was no independent nor was there any Republican opposition. So it was a very busy time. And so for many uh, parts of the city, they felt like they were having an election every month. Now, you, you just got to this same, your own election. Yes. <laughs> and you have no Republican. Uh, here we are in the summer of, uh, of 2024, yeah. but you got 91%. Now, but that's pretty hard administering an election, isn't it? Well, it's very, very difficult. You just want to make sure your equipment's tested, that we had about, uh, they had several precincts that had changed after we had to, after the redistricting process, had the boundary lines, and the county commissioner were drawn, and so in the state, the county commissioners are the ones that determine where the precincts are. So there were some precincts that changed. Um, and so, and then there were some that, some places that had been places that no longer want to serve as polling precincts. So that always adds a different level of stress to make sure that voters know where they're going to go to vote. Uh, because no matter how many times you put it out there, if you mail the cars at the Board of Registrar Sims, you do TV, radio, social media, on election day, people are going to say, I didn't hear anything about my polling precinct change. So that always creates a high level of stress and anxiety are really trying to make sure people have to go in that situation. But you always want to also make sure that we get the results, uh, you know, tabulated and reported as quickly as possible. Uh, I bet you have people's campaigns that are waiting, don't you? <laughs> oh, yes. And, you know, Election Day is busy because, uh, you know, people are calling with issues they may have seen at some of the precincts. So when you've got, uh, you know, 51 precincts throughout Montgomery County, um, and someone may see something or you may have a candidate or someone from his team that's within the 30 feet or sometimes, you know, things get heated at some of the precincts and you got campaigns kind of uh, or campaign people out there fighting each other kind of and getting in disagreement had to go ahead and quell those. So did you have, did you have any of those this last congressional thing? Uh, not, not on Tuesday. It was very, mm -hmm. very quiet. It was very, very peaceful. So 
Um, Did you have any of the first primaries? Uh, you know, because you had so many people running. running and you had some campaigns that things got heated uh -huh. uh, out there with, uh, with just the stress and the emotion of the campaign. And so we had to go out and kind of quiet some things down and talk to some campaigns and make sure your staff can kind of uh, play nice in the sandbox so we can go ahead and have a peaceful election. You know, uh, that election was a pretty good one. Uh, but Shamari Figures came out on the Democratic side pretty big. Yes, he did. Won 61 to 39. It's, uh, J.C., I, the thing that surprised me, and I said this on CBS 8 last night, that uh, the whole thing has been surprised why there was not any big names in Montgomery that ran that race. Uh, but having said that, I know enough about politics to know that if you came to me as a friend and said, what do you think I'll run for Congress to be probate judge in Montgomery County, I'd say you'll be probate judge yes. in Montgomery County. <laughs> I told Kirk Hatch the same thing. I said, Kirk, you can stay right here in your own ballywick, sleep in your own bed, sure. not get on an airplane and fly 12 hours or whatever you know you got to do to get to Washington, or not 12, but anyway, you, every week you're on a plane. You can be right here at your own church, your own, uh, you know, and you, you really got more power. Oh, well. It's one of 35 in the state Senate. Well, that's true. I mean, true. you're the only probate judge. Yeah, that's what I sometimes tease my, my colleagues who are the district and circuit judges. I call them A judges. I'm a the, the judge. I said, well, y'all have to say y'all are a circuit judge or a district judge. I can say I'm the probate right. judge. There's only one of me, but. I think my wife would agree that uh, Montgomery was the best place for me, but I, I, I'm enjoying being probate judge, and we still have some more things we want to, to do over the next few years. What, what all uh, are you want to get see done in the office? More computerization? Well, or? one of the things that we've been really working on since I got there with Chief Justice Parker was making Montgomery County one of the first probate courts in the state to be on Alifile. So about 15 years, there have been an electronic filing system where the attorneys and the litigants in the district and the circuit courts have been able to file pleadings electronically. And so we've been really behind the times, still dealing with paper. And so it'll make us much more efficient, uh, save us money on printing, cause one to print as many orders or pay as much postage to mail out orders. And so we'll be much more efficient. So that's one of the big projects that I'd like to figure out. And we're also working to go ahead and put kiosks in the grocery stores. So hopefully by sometime this fall, by the end of the year, when you go to a Publix here that uh, when it's time to renew your, your your tag, you can go while you're doing your grocery shopping, go ahead and pay your money, get your sticker, and then put it on your car. So that's something we've really been working on for the past couple of years to get that here in Montgomery County. And we're still trying to address mental health, trying to get another mental health therapist on our staff to be able to help direct families to resources, conduct uh, assessments where necessary, and be able to help what we're doing. Uh, what Caristar is doing with the Crisis Diversion Center and uh, trying to put community mental health officers on the street to be uh, those that point of contact when a member of the public or uh, another first responder comes across someone who may be undergoing, uh, you know, a mental crisis or psychosis, they're the individual that's called to be able to respond, to be able to assess the situation, and hopefully get them to where they need to go or de-escalate it if necessary. And so. Um, you know, really working to, to try to get that on. Um, that's been a project we've been working on for the past couple of years as well with Sheriff Cunningham and uh, with uh, Chief Albert since he's been in the, in, in the in, at the Montgomery Police Department. I really like, I like uh, the, uh, the fact that you got 91%. <laughs> I, I, I looked at that election and I said, I can, I, I, first of all, I got to er, thinking earlier in the year, I said, I've got to get J.C., uh, probate judge J.C. Lowe on the show. But back to the whole thing, were you surprised that, that uh, none of the big names, uh, I'd say the big three in Montgomery would be you, J.C. Lowe, the probate judge, Stephen Reed, the mayor of Montgomery, and Kirk Hatcher, the primary state senator in the Democratic part of the city. I, I, I was quite surprised, but... I also know that I wouldn't have done it either. Yeah. Like if, he, if you'd call me on the yeah. phone and says, Steve, you're my friend, you're yeah. my mentor yeah. and, and confidant. Uh, do you think I'll run for Congress or, or probate judge? I'd say, J.C., even if you could win, yeah. I think uh, I'd stay probate judge. 
Oh, you can yeah. be with your children. Children need you at this time in life. Oh, yeah. My, my children are eight, seven, and six. And so definitely it was not something I was really looking at having, like you said, to be on a plane twice a week to get there by Monday Monday by, by Monday morning when they gavel everything in and then trying to rush on a plane Thursday or Friday to get back for the weekend and then spend the weekend out in the community all around uh -huh. 12 different counties. And so it would be that. That's the key. Yes. <laughs> That's a big district, too. Yes, it is. I and mean, so you'd have somebody there. in Mobile who who's gone door to door for you oh yeah say i want you to come my preacher's anniversary well how do you say no to that you can't you got to go there and now your sunday's gone your sunday's gone you're tired you've kind of put your family aside because you're down there that's the job requires because you're really much running every other year so your campaign is yeah is non-stop and i think with the mayor he had just won re-election back last year having to go ahead and turn around and declare before you even get sworn in was probably yeah. uh, something he really won. And I know that Senator Hatcher, he's um, talked he about He thought about it first. Oh, he did. And I think his mother is, is, you know, health has been an issue and wanted to be close to her. And it, it's, a, it's a grind going back and forth to Washington. So it's, it's not, not for the fan part. It's not a fun job that you uh, think no. <laughs> it is. I mean, and you're just one of a number. Yeah, you are. You're, you're coming in as one with probably as close to 435 as possible, so your seniority is uh -huh. is zero. And so in, in Congress, everything is on seniority. About the length of time you're being there, the more influence, the more of an effect that you can have on legislation and really trying to bring home the, the bacon to your district um, that, you know, you, you gotta kind of have to wait your turn. When it came down to uh, who all was in the race, did you, did you figure that Shamari figures and Anthony Daniels would ultimately be in the runoff? How did uh, who'd you have in the runoff? I, I really had those two, just from the get-go, just knowing that Representative Daniels, him being the minority leader, and um, that he had a lot of financial support coming in early. Mm -hmm. And I knew Shamari, you know, was going to have a lot of support down in Mobile, knowing who his mom and his yeah. family was. He re that, re that really paid off. Yes, it did. Um, but he so also brought a lot of money with him from Washington. Oh, yeah, he did, you know. I so think it was there, Eric Holder connection or something like that. It was, yeah, I believe it was a family connection and, and just being uh -huh. tied into the, the whole Obama network and being a part of the administration, uh -huh. I'm sure, was able to bring some money back to the district as well. And I think you also had some renewed interest in Mobile just because they are uh, trying to expand their, their port, uh, seeing how beneficial it would be to have two, uh, you know, congressional seats uh, for the city of Mobile. Well, you know, that's... Uh, that, that, that business community down there is really concerned about that because Jerry Carl was kind of a pro-business Republican, mm -hmm. uh, whereas Barry Moore is more of a uh, Freedom Caucus Republican. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the business community down there is concerned that that new first district, yes. they're going to be shortchanged. I think the Mobile Which, business community is really concerned about that. Now you talking about some money being spent in the fall. Oh yes, this race is going. It's, it's, it's a swing district. It's going to be. It can go either way. Well, yes. You know, you look at how close the numbers have gotten in Washington, uh, particularly Republican side, with the number of Republicans retiring early. It's razor thin. Yeah. And this is a seat they have got to hold in order to try to keep their majority. And the Democrats would love to be able to have this, particularly because of uh, what it take to get this seat as another opportunity seat. Um, and so Democrats are really going to have to, to turn out. And there's going to be some money spent on the Democratic side as well. So it's going to be interesting to watch. Oh, it's going to be so much Washington money coming oh, yes. in. <laughs> Judges, it's going to be, I told my TV station here, or I told them early on, I said, y'all fix to make some money off yes. this thing. You know, because in Mobile and Montgomery Sullivan, they're going to make some real money. Oh, yeah, there's going to be a lot of money spent on ads, I would say, probably beginning right after Labor Day. Uh -huh. It'll be quiet up until people, you know, kids getting out of school, just, you know, summer vacations. But once Labor Day hits, then it'll be kind of game on in those last hundred days trying to get to November. Well, uh, you, uh, you, are you going to get out and go to things even though you have no opponent? So oh, yeah. So you'll you'll still go to things, won't you? Well, things haven't slowed down. I'm always out mm -hmm. in the neighborhood talking about initiatives that we have going on. Obviously, our REAT program to prevent... Uh, property fraud has really been a yeah, hit out here. Go over that and, with our folks, if you would. Well, it's a program we uh, uh, developed and rolled out last year to really try to help Montgomery residents prevent property fraud. And so, is there a, a lot free, of that going on, JC? Yeah, it is. It's something that we're seeing more and more of, uh, not only around here but really nationwide. Um, that people are 
uh, filing these fraudulent uh, deeds in order to take people's property and because the information they need to do it is all public record. They can walk into any real estate office, any probate office in the state, their the records and recording and be able to see the information they need for a fraudulent deed. Look up uh, the deed, the records by name or address so you know whose name is on the deed. You got the property description name and uh, you know and if it's presented to us in proper form then we have to record it. So we don't have the thing to say, Steve, hey, I just got a quick claim deed. Did you really execute this? You know, to give your house mm -hmm. to someone that we have to go and uh, record it. And so what it is is that at any time, any type of real estate record or deeds filed against any property owned in Montgomery County, you're going to get an email alert within 24 hours alerting you of the document and providing you a copy of it. And so there's an update we hope to roll out in the next 30 days that for those residents here who don't have access to email or broadband, they can still sign up and they'll get um, their notification mailed to them. And so for some of our younger residents, we've heard from them who say, I don't do email. Um, so they can get a text, you can sign up and get a text, ba text notification anytime anything's signed against you. So we want you to be able to take early action because many times with this fraud, you don't really realize you've been a victim when you're trying to sell or refinance some property. You get a foreclosure notice from some mortgage company that you don't know telling you they're going to foreclose on your property for a mortgage you didn't know you had. Or as one woman who had contacted us right when we rolled it out, that she realized she had been a victim because she realized she didn't get her property tax statement. And when she called, she saw I was going to another address, checked her property records and seen that someone had filed a fraudulent deed to take Miami, Miami. a father that a house that her father had had lived in and left her when he had passed a year prior. So uh, we just want to, you know, be able to provide this service and let people be able to try to hopefully get those folks who are doing this and really put a kind of a, a little uh, light on Montgomery County. So those people who want to do it will see that we have this program and they'll go ahead and bypass Montgomery County. Well, Judge, our time's up. Oh, it's quick. It goes by in a hurry, doesn't yes. it? Yes. <laughs> I appreciate you taking time to be with us. Well, thank you always for having me on. It's always a pleasure to sit down and talk with you. Folks, I guess the bet today has been uh, probate judge J.C. Love, Montgomery County. We thank him, thank him for thank him, taking the time out of his schedule to be with us, and we thank you viewers for watching, and hope you tune in next week for Alabama Politics. Thank you.